New York on Manhattan's 52nd Street. You can get some of the best Korean dishes. In 2010, Hooni Kim opened a Korean restaurant there called Tanji, and it's been a hit with New Yorkers ever since. Ten months after it opened, in October 2011, it became the first Korean restaurant to receive a star in the Michelin Guide. Bolstered by Tanji's success, Kim opened a second restaurant called Hanjan. Once again, it was a hit. Chelsea Clinton, daughter of the former president, Drew Barrymore, and Natalie Portman, and celebrity chefs like Daniel Bouloud and Guy Fieri are among the many famous regulars at Huni Kim's restaurants. As a chef, Kim insists on using only the best chang, made the traditional way in Korea. In fact, penjang is the secret ingredient in his sauces, and it's what gives his dishes their distinctively rich flavor. This week on Heart to Heart, we meet Huni Kim, the chef who's breaking new ground in the globalization of Korean cuisine. to the show, Mr. Kim, it's great to have you on. And I've been watching you on TV a lot, but it's great to have you here on the set at Heart to Heart. Let's talk about um, what kind of really got you famous here in Korea, especially uh, the Michelin star, of course. And that came less than a year after you opened up your restaurant, Tanji. And I hear that with the Michelin Guide, they send out these kind of undercover inspectors, so you don't know who's been or when they went until the reviews come out. So mm. tell us about how you got the news, whether you had to wait until it actually came out or did you receive some sort of a phone call? Or? Um, Michelin has a tradition mm -hmm. where they call the chefs personally mm -hmm. the morning the stars come out. Um, and I did receive a phone call in the afternoon congratulating me. Um, and it was a lady mm -hmm. and uh, I wasn't expecting a phone call. Uh, didn't even know they did that. <laughs> But she called and she congratulated me for first Korean restaurant ever right. for a Michelin star. And it caught me by surprise. So I asked her, oh, who is this, by the way? And she said... You thought it was a joke, maybe, or um, a prank? Just curious. <laughs> who is this Michelin uh -huh. um, person that's calling me? And then her response was, I'm sorry, I'm not allowed to reveal who I... I was like, ah, oh, then it's real. <laughs> and it's real. Um, so... Actually, that day, we had a big event. We had a 600-person party that we had to sort of um, cater. Uh -huh. uh, so it, I heard it, and then back to work. Back to work. Uh, because I had worked in three Michelin stars right. restaurants. Mm -hmm. uh, so one, it was a, I was happy, mm -hmm. grateful, but had work to do. Didn't know it was a big deal. Mm -hmm. um, until the next day, actually, when I came to work and there was... Um, quite a few Korean media people asking okay. questions mm -hmm. before the restaurant opened. So I thought, wow, Michelin star, huh? <laughs> <laughs> okay, so not only were you the first Korean restaurant to receive the Michelin star, but to receive it under a year since you opened, that must be quite rare too. No? Yeah, you know what? That's, um, I, I still can't figure it out. Uh, it's, it's rare. Mm -hmm. And also, we were so casual, mm. you know. Um, Different from like the New York Times or the New York Magazine where we expected the food to be good enough for us to be reviewed. Mm -hmm. They don't uh, just go out to fancy uh, fine dining restaurants. Right. Whereas the Michelin, they focus on, I think, the whole experience. Mm -hmm. And our restaurant, we don't have tablecloths. We have paper napkins. Um, it's, it's very affordable. It's mm -hmm. very casual. And, you know, if I had thought... A Michelin star was my goal, you know, it would have been a completely different restaurant. Right. But this one, Danji, my first one, I just wanted to focus great ingredients, Korean food, mm -hmm. authentic Korean flavors. So, you know, becoming famous, being a chef at this one specific restaurant, that was not even in my mind. Mm. You also mentioned that your restaurant doesn't have white tablecloths and mm. you have paper napkins, but I also imagine that the serving, how you present the food, is quite different from the food or 
that we're used to, maybe at a Korean restaurant mm. in Seoul, in Korea, or even K-Town, the way you serve it is quite different, isn't it? Um, Could that add to the experience? If you explain it, you, I can explain it simply in mm -hmm. that I always wanted to create a New York restaurant for New Yorkers that serve authentic Korean flavors. So the food itself is exotic. Visually, it doesn't have to be that cliche Korean mm -hmm. flag hanging everywhere. Uh, I wanted the focus just on the plate. Mm -hmm. So everything else is very casual New York, uh, typical New York service also. Mm -hmm. We have servers who English is their primary language and we'd like to educate you know, people on the ingredients, mm -hmm. uh, the way it's served, the way it's eaten. Um, and another thing is we serve small portions because... Right. Tapa style, right? Tapa style. Mm -hmm. Just because as a diner in New York, I like to eat many different things. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't appreciate going to a restaurant where the portions are this big right. and us two, we go, we have to share one mm -hmm. and we'll barely finish. Yeah. I'd rather go to a place where two of us can go and have seven, eight dishes to experience all these different flavors. Mm -hmm. And I thought that's the best way to experience Korean food. Mm -hmm. Um, because why limit yourself to one flavor when you can open yourself up to eight different new flavors mm -hmm. every time you come to my restaurant or a, right. a, a similar mm -hmm. restaurant? Mm -hmm. So I wonder how the New Yorkers are reacting to your food because you pride yourself on quite authentic tastes and mm. authentic flavors. I know that makgeolli, the mm. rice wine, the sort of fermented rice wine, is a favorite among the customers there. What else is uh, doing well? Best sellers? Um, Best sellers. Um, <laughs> I've seen some sliders. Those uh, look yeah, pretty good too. Yeah, you know, it, that was my sort of way to um, introduce bulgogi mm -hmm. and, and jeyuk, mm -hmm. uh, spicy pork, gochujang yeah. samgyeopsa, something right. like that. Um, just because bulgogi, we all know what it is, and everybody who's tasted bulgogi likes it. Mm. But on the menu, it's very difficult to sort of explain what bulgogi is. Um, I needed something mm -hmm. where it was, it was something that customers can feel comfortable ordering. And who doesn't like a slider? Mm -hmm. So what's inside is traditional Korean, when we do samjang, bulgogi, oimuchim, mm -hmm. you know, samjang, whatever. And we wrap it in lettuce. Now because it's in between two pieces of bread, they feel like, oh, I'm comfortable with that. Let's try what it is. Mm -hmm. And that's sort of how I use the slider to get these non-Koreans ordering Korean. Comfortable yeah. about, uh -huh. okay. Well, I know that after Tanji, with the success that you had in, mm. with Tanji, you opened up a second restaurant mm. called Hanjan. I think mm. it's more of a gastropub, a little bit more casual than Tanji, um, would that be right? That was our goal, that was okay. our goal. Um, and you're doing well with that. It's rated one of the top 10 restaurants of 2013 by the New York Times. Yeah, they rated us That's number amazing. five, which um, was a big surprise. It was supposed to be more, well, it is, it's more Korean. Mm -hmm. When Tanji was my attempt to introduce authentic Korean flavors mm -hmm. to New Yorkers, this one was, okay, you've done Tanji, let me bring you a little bit more of Korean. Mm -hmm. And I brought, I try to show Korean drinking culture. Mm -hmm. uh, Hanjan's inspiration was a, is a juma, mm -hmm. whereas Tanji was more like a tapas bar right. that served Korean food. Um, so we really try to pair the food that we serve with, you know, makgeolli, mm -hmm. soju, or Kajang. even beer. Yeah, yeah. 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 How are people reacting to that? So you, the taste and also the menu, I imagine, is more familiar to what we would find here in Korea. I imagine the flavors are a little bit more authentic as well. Is that a matter of trust also? Are you having more trust um, in the local clientele that they would accept this? I think the flavor isn't more authentic in, in the fact that we use the same ingredients. Mm -hmm. We get all our changs. We get five items from Korea, which I think is so important that you can't find anything similar in, in the US. Mm -hmm. It's denjang, gochujang, ganjang, changirum, and gochugaru. Mm -hmm. So those five things, instead of buying at the supermarket or it's mass produced, right. we get it from Korea. Okay. That allows us to maybe cook the same thing than other restaurants, but the flavors are so more complex, so mm -hmm. more, um, reminds you of 
시골. Yeah, countryside. Because <laughs> uh, we yeah. use the changs that Country are artisanally food. made. Yeah. It smells. It smells really bad. It's difficult to cook <laughs> to balance the salt mm -hmm. because all the, the factory tenjangs, they can afford to use less salt because mm -hmm. the fermentation process isn't very long. Mm -hmm. But natural tenjang, because it's aged a year, two, three, sometimes much more, you need a lot of salt right. to prevent uh, fungus growing. <laughs> mm -hmm. So it's salty, but it's, it's strong, it's deep. Mm -hmm. And to be able to use these changs to cook, mm -hmm. it's, it makes my job a lot easier because mm -hmm. the flavor is already there. Right. You're just sort of sharing that flavor, mm -hmm. controlling it, sharing mm -hmm. it. Mm -hmm. And you have your share, of course, of famous clientele, probably mm. because of the Michelin star and also these great uh, reviews. But I hear that people are lining up all the time, even before you open. But some of the, the more famous clientele, like Bill Clinton, Drew Barrymore. Chelsea Clinton. Chelsea Clinton, Clinton. Yes. Chelsea, Chelsea Clinton. Clinton. And Natalie Portman have mm -hmm. also been at your restaurant. And it seems like a lot of your clients actually do come back. They come back for second mm. taste or to try other things on the menu mm. that they haven't tried. But what I'm curious about is, how did you market this in the beginning? I mean, word of mouth is one thing, but to get a Michelin star, um, to get all these positive reviews, to get such a big clientele, famous clientele coming over, in the very first year or a couple of months that you open something, how do you do that from a marketing perspective? It must be very clever. No. You no? cook good food. You just cook. You cook good but food. But there are we thousands of restaurants. We haven't spent a cent really? on marketing. Um, I've learned that from my chefs that I used to work for. If people come to your restaurant based on a commercial, mm -hmm. uh, they'll go to the next restaurant when that commercial comes. True. You go to a restaurant because your friend says it tastes good. Mm -hmm. Then you go. Uh, you don't go based on magazines. Mm. Um, because, you know, these commercials and, and, and advertisements, they'll always be there. New mm -hmm. restaurants mm -hmm. will always, you know, pop up and they'll be advertising. But if you want loyal customers, first they come based on their friend's recommendation. How did the friends come, though? So, you know, the first three months, we were very, very quiet. Really? Yeah, there was one day when I think we had four customers all day. Oh. Um, December, January, February was dead. Uh, March, it started picking up. There was uh, a tipping point. Slowly, slowly. You know, basically it's one person tells two people, and they keep telling people, and right. those two tell people. So mm -hmm. it grows exponentially. Oh. Um, but, you know, the first month, practically nobody. Second month couple of people, that, but you're still losing money right. all these months. So you're, you worry. Mm. Um, and yeah, I've thought about using advertisements, but by then I couldn't really afford anything. <laughs> you just have to trust your customers, mm. you know, and you have to trust yourself. Yes. Um, did I know we were making good food? Yes, because all the customers, the mm -hmm. few that came, told us. So you just have to keep banging at it. And a lot of it's luck, too. Mm -hmm. I think the New York Magazine came first, uh, and they gave us a very good review. And then, you know, it started, started getting busier. Right. Um, you know, and the next step is to keep it up. We mm -hmm. were used to serving 30 customers a day. Now it was 100. Now it's 200. You have to keep up how good it is right. because before when we messed up, it was 30 people knowing mm -hmm. that we messed up. Now mm -hmm. it's 200 every day mm -hmm. that knows that if we mess up, they're going to tell their friends it's not good. And with the internet, of course. Yeah, now yeah. it's not just 200, it's more like yeah. thousands yeah, and thousands uh -huh. if you mess up. Well, obviously you've been doing a good job because you've maintained your Michelin star for two years now, three years now? So uh, we have three stars three on the stars. board, so yeah, three years. So I'm sure the quality is staying the same, even though you've been quite busy here as well. Well, Korean cuisine has captivated the tastemakers of New York, and the secret to its success is Chef Huni Kim's insight into the essence of Korean food. We'll be right back for more with Huni Kim. Our food is tenjang, our food is spicy, our food is gochugaru, our food is chongyang gochu. Mm -hmm. That's our food. We should be proud. We know it tastes good. We were missing out mm -hmm. on real Korean flavors.
Kimchi and bulgogi are well known to people outside of Korea, but there's something else that's also captivating the taste buds of New Yorkers, and that is, of course, chang. And we talked a little about it. Um, you're using five different sort of changs that you bring over from Korea. Um, is there a special method that you prepare with these changs? Obviously, it's from these artisanal um, mm -hmm. kitchens here in Korea, so it's good quality ingredients, mm -hmm. but there must be something special that you do to it, to prepare it for to um, the palates of Westerners? No. No? No. Um, our tenjang smells. <laughs> I think good tenjang smell, mm -hmm. and that's part of the lore. I think what the New Yorkers or the Americans are very surprised about is how something that smells not so good tastes so great. Mm -hmm. And that is, that is part of the experience, I think. Mm -hmm. Cheonggukjang, Tenjang, it smells god awful. <laughs> but when you taste it, mm -hmm. suddenly that awful smell reminds you of something that tastes so good. Mm -hmm. And there is a connection. Um, if they just smelled it, probably wouldn't like tenjang so much. Mm -hmm. But the fact that they eat it and they, they can't smell the kozohan flavor, but they can taste it. Mm -hmm. So next time they smell that sort of funk, they'll relate it <laughs> with that kozohan flavor. Uh -huh. uh, and it's almost addictive. Uh, it is. It yeah. is, mm -hmm. it is. Uh, like kimchi. Uh -huh. Yeah, yeah. Anything also spicy, you know, people right. who like it must have it. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, the better the tenjang is, the less we need to cook it. Um, and I think the better the tenjang is, you can sort of put it in a lot of different ingredients. Instead of salt, instead of kanjang, we use a lot of tenjang because tenjang has a lot of salinity salt. Of course. Um, but this salt isn't just salt salt. It's, mm -hmm. it's deeper. It has more, it's earthier. Mm. So when we, you know, kan, you know, season our food, a mm -hmm. lot of it, Putting in tenjang instead of salt gives you a deeper flavor. Our pajan at hanjan, we use a little bit of tenjang. Okay. Um, most people don't. Right. Uh, I don't know anybody who does. But when you taste our pajan, you can't taste the tenjang mm. at all. But when you do a side by side, it's so much better. <laughs> I guess more layers, just more flavor. More layers, more complexity. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. It's you, you don't taste the tenjang at all, mm. but it's seasoned with 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 Korean sort of soil, mm -hmm. with Korean nature. I think it was Pierre Gagné when some well-known celebrity, foreign celebrity chefs would come to Korea for an event. They would always make up some dishes using tang and then mm. they would say, oh, it's a great um, material for sauce. Mm -hmm. And because of your experience also in these French cuisines, French kitchens, do you also use the tang as in sort of Western sauce or is no. it more the traditional never. way? Never. Uh, okay. I think I've never tasted a tenjang where it was made better. Mm. By adding butter, cream, tenjang. Butter is makes everything better. True, not tenjang. Not tenjang. <laughs> not tenjang. I think tenjang should be used as tenjang. Okay. It, it, it. Why mess with something that's so almost perfect? Mm. Um, nothing against the chefs, mm -hmm. but it's almost like you know taking something that is so traditionally and historically Korean mm. and having to westernize it to please to the western people. But, not... but that's something that a lot of people have been talking about because, you know, the whole globalization of Korean food mm. just wasn't uh. working out and they're thinking maybe it's just too strong, too spicy, too salty, just mm. too foreign for, for western palates. So maybe we need to add a little butter or cream, maybe, you know, make it less strong. But you don't agree with that school of thought? Yeah, I mean, that, that, that offends me. I mean, why cover up our Koreanness? Mm -hmm. Our food is bold. Our food is tenjang. Our food is spicy. Our food is gochugaru. Our food is cheongyang gochu. Mm -hmm. That's our food. We should be proud. And, you know, we know it tastes good. And me, I'm more of a New Yorker than Korean, I think. I've mm -hmm. been coming here often, but my taste bud is Korean, and I prefer Korean Korean food than... New York Korean food. Um, and it is these reasons why I bring, in, bring these ingredients. But, mm -hmm. you know, I think Korean food is, you can't fusion Korean food too much. Mm -hmm. You know, you either have these flavors, which I think is the most important part of Korean food. It's not the way you serve it. It's not the presentation. It's the core flavors. 
you have to sort of focus on the core flavors and give it to or, or spread the word or communicate with, with people who love food. Because mm -hmm. the only way I like a certain cuisine, I go to a restaurant that serves that cuisine really well and eat it. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the best way to globalize Korean food. You know, a lot of Korean restaurants aren't very good. We don't have the ingredients. Mm. If I had opened Danji 15 years ago, how do I get the Korean changs to the U.S.? Impossible. It would cost me, Denjang would cost $50. Um, but now with the transportation being easier, a lot of Korean companies sort of um, doing business, mm -hmm. sending ingredients, we can really get these really good ingredients and make better Korean food. And I think that's the way the Korean government can help us as restaurant owners. And we are the only, these Americans will not cook Korean food if they don't like Korean food. And when you have Americans living in New York cooking Korean food at home because they liked going out to a Korean restaurant, mm -hmm. I think that's how you sort of define success in the globalization of Korean cuisine. Mm. So difficult question then. How would you like to define your style? From all the other Korean foods, how would you define your culinary style? Oh. You know, I think, I think it's a new way of cooking Korean food. Um, Korean food, like I said, the best part is the flavors. What it's lacking is I think Korea, not the fact that Korea doesn't have a lot of restaurants, too many restaurants, <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> so many restaurants, but the history of restaurants mm -hmm. isn't that long. We've gone through several wars, an occupation, where um, you know, cooking good technical food was the last thing on our mind right. in this country for a long time. Mm -hmm. While that was going on, France was developing these techniques, writing books about it, mm -hmm. writing encyclopedias, writing history books based on the food and how to cook it. So France, technique, is, is the foundation of, of the art of cooking. Right. Uh, we have to learn the science behind the cooking techniques, the, the, the biology behind the ingredients, mm -hmm. the chemistry behind the techniques, the physics behind um, just your body and doing whatever you need to mm -hmm. do. Korea doesn't have that yet. Um, so I don't wanna say that I'm improving Korean food, but bringing this sort of historical science and technique and applying it to Korean cuisine, you can only make it better. Mm -hmm. Um, because cooking is, is, the most important thing is extracting flavor from an ingredient. Mm -hmm. The more you can, the more flavor you can get from that one ingredient, right. the better the food's going to be. And that is technique. That is um, like our kalbi jim. You know, you go to so many of these kalbi jim restaurants, texture's always different. Some soft, some hard, sometimes it takes 20 minutes, sometimes it takes 45 minutes. There's a science when how you, the science that you apply to make the best kalbi jin. You know, there are fibers in the kalbi that mm -hmm. makes it chewy, and then there's the fat inside that makes it pillowy, soft, mm -hmm. and tasty. The fibers melt before the fat. It doesn't melt at the same time. Mm -hmm. So the perfect kalbi jin is when all the fibers have all melted and the fat is still there you cook for a longer time, this disappears too. Wow. So that perfect time is, um, I can tell you in, in Fahrenheit, 325 degrees Fahrenheit for two and a half hours is that perfect time. Anything less, you're gonna get the fiber. Mm -hmm. Anything more, you lose the fat. There's your perfect kalbi jim, perfect kalbi jim, texture-wise mm -hmm. and flavor-wise for the kalbi. Whatever you put in, the French put in red wine, mm -hmm. you know, mirepoix. Koreans, we like to put in ganjang, manu, so the flavor is authentic Korean. Mm -hmm. The science is, I don't want to say French science, but it is. You know, the science behind cooking, the French have developed. They came up with it. Yeah. yeah. Um, and I don't like to call this fusion food because you look at it, you taste it. It is all Korean. Mm -hmm. And that's sort of what I try to do with, with uh, Korean food. I think that would also help in helping to globalize Korean food, as we say, because, you know, a lot of these Korean cookbooks, mm -hmm. and I've bought my share too. I find some of the best ones 
are not very exact when it comes to how mm. you should cook it. And you know, they always say a pinch of salt or you know, a bigger pinch of this, or, but it's not very scientific. So the results vary from mm. wildly. And if I'm having a good day, everything will come out perfect. But if I'm having an off day, it'll just be completely different. And I'm still using the same recipe. So maybe applying that science could make it more accessible to a lot of more people. Um, yeah, definitely, definitely. Uh, but also with Korean food, I think sunmat is a huge factor. Um, <laughs> How would you explain that in, in, in English? How do you say that to Korean, I mean, U.S. customers? I would say this, I would say, you have, the t you have two same recipes. Yes. Two people cook it with the two same ingredients. They'll, it'll taste different. Mm -hmm. um, and that's sunmat that's accidental. But what you have to do with that recipe Recipe is just a guideline. You have to, when you cook this recipe at home, you have to make it your own. You have to own it. Oh, that's easy for so you to say. A pinch of salt? Yes. No, <laughs> I like a little bit more salt. Uh, Kanjang okay. teaspoon? I don't want to use it. Uh -huh. you, you, just, you have to make it your own. Mm. And the only way you do that is understanding the ingredients. Um, I'm on the show, uh, Master Chef, mm -hmm. and I'm teaching these students challengers mm -hmm. um, and a lot of them are fixed on recipes how do I how do I make this how do I and they don't understand the ingredients yet mm -hmm. they look at the recipe they follow it but they don't ask why why do I only cook the onion 10 minutes with low heat mm -hmm. why can't I cook it five minutes with high heat makes sense right but it's different mm -hmm. onion when you cook it with high heat gets color mm -hmm. caramelizes low heat it becomes really soft and the juices come out the flavoring what's mm -hmm. around, surrounding it. Mm. You have to understand the onion to understand the recipe. And a lot of people, especially home cooks, they buy this cookbook, tells you nothing about the ingredients really, mm -hmm. but has this guideline on, on how to cook it. You understand the ingredients, you become a much better cook. It's like, it's like learning a language, you know? You learn French. Um, the recipe is a poem. Unless you know the words, it doesn't really make sense. Uh -huh. the, the words are the ingredients. Mm -hmm. Understanding ingredients makes you understand food, understand cooking, more comfortable with the kitchen. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, traditional Korean chang is gaining fans throughout the world. And let's take a look at where the chang New Yorkers are enjoying comes from. New York, it's the greatest city in the world. Chef Kuni Kim's Tanji is always busy, full of regulars and people who have heard good things about the place. I think anybody who enjoys eating, they like delicious food, whether it be Korean, Japanese, Chinese, Italian. And I think Korean food, if you cook well, with, with, with really good ingredients, uh, and you make beautiful, delicious food, you know, anybody and everybody will like it. Tanji managed to win over the hard to please New Yorkers with a menu based on Kuni Kim's principle of using fresh ingredients and putting the time and effort into each dish. But his secret weapon is his sauce, made out of traditional Korean pinjang. In order to bring out the true flavors of Korean tang in his dishes, Huni Kim only uses the famous Chukjang Yang Tang from a village nestled deep in the mountains. The people here have been making tang for generations. Every time he comes to Korea, Huni Kim comes here to taste the tang that's aging in the large earthenware pots. Tang, it's, it's the foundation of Korean cooking. You know, the changs is, are what makes Korean flavors unique. It's what um, makes everything taste better, or everything taste Korean. Traditional Korean tang takes 30,000 hours to fully mature. After the long wait, Chef Huni Kim uses it to inject a little youthful energy into new creations. The result is a taste that's loved by people around the world. Huni 
Jimmy Kim's food philosophy values authenticity over tradition, and his creative and sophisticated dishes have found favor in New York. And of course, now you're familiar to a lot of our viewers here in Korea because of your program, Master Chef Korea, mm. and you're participating as the first time. Um, as a big fan of the show as well, I like how you give your, your verdicts. Usually, it's especially the preliminary round, you just said, it's good, so yes. It tastes good, so yes. Is it really, I mean, you've talked a lot about how it just, food should just be about tasting good. Um, of course, the experience would count as well, but is it that simple when you when you taste something? Is good or bad that simple to distinguish? Yes. Uh, is for that me, because you're a, is that um, because you're a very experienced chef, or should no, it be the same for no, everyone? I think it's not because I'm a chef. I think it's because I love food. Mm -hmm. I like to eat. I much prefer to eat than to cook. <laughs> and I think that'll always be the case. I'd rather go to my friend's Shouldn't restaurant. Should you have been a critic then, or maybe food critic? Um, yeah, <laughs> I mean, I, I feel like that's what I do most of the time when I'm, especially when I'm here, because mm -hmm. I don't cook here, right. um, and I enjoy it a lot more. Mm -hmm. um, and as a Mishka, I can tell you what makes me happy. Food that tastes good. Mm -hmm. A lot of the food that tastes good, you don't know what it is. You don't, you know, I don't know what it is. I don't know what it's made of, mm -hmm. but it puts a smile on your face. That's when I know the food's good. And as a judge, I'm sure you have to be impartial, but mm. generally speaking, what is the, how is the quality of the cooking that you're seeing on MasterChef? Because in um, Korea, you've seen this huge boom and mm. we have so many foodies, so many food programs now, many sort of diverse cuisines mm. are also on offer now than ever before. Mm. How would you rate the, the ability of the, the chefs in your program or I think MasterChef Korea is, is unique then I don't know if there are other cooking shows, but here we only bring in amateurs. Mm -hmm. They're not professional chefs or cooks, mm -hmm. they're amateurs. What surprised me the most is their, their drive, their, their, um, their pursuit of, of knowledge in this cooking industry, in this field. They weren't very good, a lot of them. But When they started? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah uh, and even the, the, you know, the first couple of episodes where you have a hundred challengers coming and we have to pick the ones who we think has the most potential. Mm -hmm. A lot of them was, they weren't good, uh, especially, I don't know if I might get in trouble saying this, it's okay. but um, these sort of princess or prince type people, mm -hmm. very good looking, you know, proud of themselves coming in letting us taste food that they were so proud of. But of course their friends are gonna say it tastes good. You know, of course their parents are gonna say it tastes good. As a judge where we don't really care who you are, mm -hmm. we taste the food and it's not good. And you see the expression like, ah, how could you do this to me? How could you not like me? No, it's not about you. It's about the food. Mm -hmm. Your parents say they like the food because they like you. Your friends say they like the food because they like you. Us. We don't know who you are. Mm. We only know what's on the plate. And on the plate, you're not very pretty. Mm. You know, and that way, it's very honest in the way we pick our, our uh, contestants. There are people who come with, there was one girl who came with, a, and I've said this story before, chicken katsu. Mm -hmm. And that Fried was- chicken cutlets? Yeah, high school girl. And we see the menu, what they're gonna bring before, and we're like, she can make the best chicken katsu in the world, but that's not going to be good enough for her to pass. Because everybody was bringing some like really elaborate, um, dishes. elaborate right. dishes. She came in and uh, basically she said, I'm in high school. I live far away from Seoul. I haven't eaten much. This is who I am. So brave. Mm -hmm. A lot of people come pretend to be something that yes. they're not. This is who I am. Uh -huh. Judge me on this. Mm -hmm. It was crispy. It was seasoned well. <laughs> so she passed. Wow. With a chicken katsu. <laughs> I know that that's actually something you stress if you, to aspiring chefs, you say, go out there and taste as many different mm. foods as you can. This high school kid obviously didn't try a lot of food. Mm. 
so they should try a lot of different foods, but what if you don't have the money? And also, another thing that I know that you stress is the technique. Mm. You've mentioned that having the taste buds, recognizing good food is important, but it also does take technique. Yes. And it probably comes from your own experience, mm -hmm. learning about the ingredients, how to handle the ingredients. So is it both? Are some people just born with great taste buds? Do you always have um, to have... We can't all live in New York and have that great food, right? Uh, it's very true, I think. But Korea, Seoul, has come such a long way from 10 years ago, mm -hmm. where we can really get authentic pasta here now. 10 years ago, it was, it was <laughs> Korean-style pasta, uh, even hamburgers. Mm -hmm. It was, you know, McDonald's-style hamburgers. Now you can get gourmet hamburgers, authentic Italian, Japanese, French food. Um, they're expensive, but as a chef, or as an up-and-coming cook or somebody who wants to be a chef, spending money on food is an investment. For somebody who is not, mm -hmm. it's, it's joy, it's hobby, it's luxury. luxury. Uh -huh. But for a cook, you are investing in yourself. Mm -hmm. um, Technique-wise, you know, it's cooking. People say it's art. I think 1% is art. I think the first 99% you have to learn is a, is a skill. I, I, I sort of associate it with furniture. This furniture that somebody builds mm -hmm. is a craftsman. They know how to make sturdy furniture where mm -hmm. I'm not going to fall. No matter how beautiful a chair is, if I sit down and fall, that's a crappy chair. Of course. Food. No matter how beautiful Mm -hmm. artistic it looks, if it doesn't taste good, True. it's garbage. Mm -hmm. um, so learn how, how to build the food, build the furniture, mm -hmm. make good food first, tasty food. Mm -hmm. And then your creative outlet sort of can take over and make beautiful dishes. So it's quite famous how you became a chef. Um, it was not your dream from when you were a young child. You mm. studied biology, you went to medical school, and then when you were taking a year off, you just, or you went into culinary school, yeah. and then that's where you went on a different path. Mm. And then, of course, you worked at these Michelin star restaurants. A couple of things that I'm curious about. One, how did your parents react when you said, mom and dad, or dad, or mom, mom, uh, mom I'm giving up this very lucrative, stable, highly respected, not that chefs are not, but I think being they're a not. doctor, being a, doc <laughs> yeah, being a doctor is to, like, yeah. a, you know, it's a, mm. every mother's dream for her son or daughter to go to med school and become a doctor. So how your family reacted when you, just, when you said, I'm switching paths, and very radically too. And then two, how did a med school student manage to get into a Michelin star kitchen was it just out of culinary school? How do you do that? Yeah, it was just out of culinary school. Uh, and I'll answer that question first. Mm -hmm. um, I didn't go to Danielle looking for a job. I went to Danielle to learn. And I said, you don't have to give me any money. Oh. I will do what you tell me to do, but just let me be here. And in two weeks, they offered me a job. I think it was very honest. I didn't expect a job because, you know, three months later, I had to go back to school. Um, so I had three months time and my experience, well, I wanted the best restaurant experience possible mm -hmm. at that time. And for me, Danielle was it. You've gotten, you've been there before to eat as yes, a customer? Yes, okay. yeah. Um, it's actually five blocks from where I grew up. Okay. Um, so I went there just to learn. Mm. And when they offered me that job, it was sort of, that, that's where the, the fork in the road comes. Do I go back to school to be a doctor that I hate? Or do I get to cook in the best kitchen that mm -hmm. I think there is in New York, in the US, and make nothing? <laughs> well, a little bit of it. Right. Um, so I discussed it with my wife, uh -huh. uh, and she was very supportive, surprisingly. Mm. Um, not that big as, <laughs> well, not that big of a surprise, because her reasoning was, she's a lawyer. Mm -hmm. Hates being a lawyer. <laughs> corporate lawyer. A lot of corporate lawyers don't enjoy being that, uh, but they do it because the money is so lucrative. Mm -hmm. And what else can they do? You know, they went to law school, they became a lawyer, mm -hmm. um, and you're sort of trapped. Um, 
and she felt trapped. Mm. So she thought, and we had just gotten married, newlyweds, and she said, her unhappiness was enough for this household. If I was unhappy with my job too, that would be horrible. Amazing, so, very understanding. Yeah, wow. smart, <laughs> smarter than me. <laughs> so she let me, mm -hmm. you know, pursue this career. My mom wasn't too fond of that. <laughs> she, uh, no, she tried to convince my wife to convince me because she wouldn't talk to me. She, one year, she would not, <gasps> we did not speak. And she would try to convince my wife. And my wife was excellent being that wall. Wow. She would just take everything that my mom said and, and she didn't relay it. it to you? No. no she, your mom's not happy. Yeah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> I know. Um, but because of that, I was able to change careers. Wow. Mm -hmm. But now, you know, people who've seen our interview, they're all going to go knock on the doors of all the famous kitchens and say, take me, I'll work for free. Best way to learn. But they don't take anybody and they don't offer a yeah, job two weeks later. Yeah, they do. They do? You see, it's actually funny. <laughs> I had dinner a couple of days ago with a friend of the family and she owns a couple of restaurants and she's been watching MasterChef and she pointed out a character to me and she's like, him, bring him to me. I will teach him how to cook. Oh. You can see the, the drive, the, the yearning to learn, mm -hmm. um, knowing that or realizing I don't know anything, mm -hmm. or the more I learn in cooking, the less you know. Please teach me. And she saw that, and she's like, bring him over. Mm -hmm. I want to teach him. Um, so I'm actually arranging that. That's amazing. And a lot of chefs, I think, you know, if we can see somebody who will listen to us, and that's all we ask for, mm -hmm. we'll teach you, just have an open mind. Listen to me, learn. And don't be greedy about money and work mm -hmm. schedule. That, please, I'm going to make you a great chef. Trust me. And a lot of kids don't have that. A lot of kids, you know, they come, they graduate school, and they want to be a chef right away. Mm -hmm. School gives you, is a start. Graduating school is a start. Before you go to school, you don't even have to go to school. But learning how to knife, learning a couple of degrees, that's a start. Mm -hmm. There's so much more you need to learn before you can open up your restaurant. And, and I think that's a, a message that I do wanna get out to a lot of Koreans who are learning how to cook abroad. I don't give lessons at my kitchen. Mm -hmm. Our goal is the customers. But if you are good enough, everything that we do in the kitchen, you learn from. Mm -hmm. Every person next to you, you learn from. Even the dishwasher, you learn from. Because that dishwasher has been doing dishes for 30 years with the best chefs, you can learn from him. Mm -hmm. And being a good cook lets you learn from everybody. And just imagine, before you had 30 kids in a class with one teacher, now you are one with 30 teachers mm -hmm. that you can learn from. And I think with that mentality, you know, being a chef isn't too difficult with that mentality. Well, Huni Kim comes to Korea every year to work, rest, eat and also be inspired. We followed him one day to see what's rousing his interest these days. Huni Kim is spending three months in Korea this summer. It's the longest he's ever been in Korea and he shored up many special experiences. He was the judge on a cooking competition show where he was touched by the Korean passion for food and cooking. He went to a dok or rice cake cafe where he had shaved ice with toasted bean powder for the first time. Shortly before he scheduled to leave, Huni Kim stepped into the kitchen. He wanted to introduce his special dish to Koreans. Huni Kim's philosophy is that it's not real Korean food until it has pinjang in it. So 
the highlight of this dish is the taste of traditional chang, which is enhanced by the golden ratio of tuenjang to gochujang. Basically what it is is our samjang, our, uh, there's tofu, there's ground beef, there's some onions, and you can make it in less than 10 minutes. Uh, and it's for people who live by themselves, um, who don't want to take a lot of time cooking, spend a lot of time cooking. So these, uh, all you need is one jar, one tofu, and some ground meat and some vegetables, and you have a quick 10 minute dinner. This is what Huni Kim calls real Korean food. But what do Koreans think? I spent three and a half months in Korea now. It's the longest I've spent in a very long time. And, uh, you know, I, I do feel like this is my home. Uh, every time I come to Korea, I do get this feeling that I'm back at my Goyang. And I'm leaving tomorrow, and it's, it's sad. It's a sad feeling. Um, but I had such a good experience working with so many wonderful people here um, that I, I'm just looking forward to coming back next time, hopefully soon. When he returns to New York, Chef Huni Kim will update his culinary style based on his recent experiences in Korea. We have high hopes for his unique brand of Korean food. So how did they like the food? Because I know that some Koreans, or actually quite a lot of Koreans, are very particular when it comes to Korean food. Mm -hmm. And it's very difficult to satisfy them. They'll say it's not authentic enough, or mm. I don't know. How do they react to um, what you cooked for them? You know, this, this dish isn't authentic. Mm -hmm. um, the, the reason why I cooked this specific dish was, you know, I'm working with the, the Tenjang company that provides me with the Tenjang, and I really wanted to highlight the Tenjang. Mm -hmm. And to me, I created this dish based on the, the my inspiration was mapo tofu. You know, uh -huh. tofu, tejigogi, right. and, and the Sichuan peppercorns, a very good pairing. Mm -hmm. um, but what makes that Chinese food is the Sichuan peppercorns and the red sauce. Took that out, put the tenjang in. Mm -hmm. So it's a uh, tenjang mapo tofu. I actually kind of make a version of that for my I son. I think all yeah. of us do, but uh, nobody really sells it at restaurants because right, right, it's right. sort of, you know, bastardized <laughs> cuisine. But uh -huh. it tastes good and it really does highlight the tenjang. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, we made that dish um, and it wasn't to sort of show off my or me. It was to highlight the tenjang. Mm -hmm. And I think it did its job because... A lot of people with the aroma, mm -hmm. they stop by and they taste it, and hopefully they bought. And they can also think of creative ways to use tenjang mm. now, like just regular Koreans. Yeah, yeah. You know, the way we use tenjang, gochujang, it doesn't always have to be for tenjang jjigae no, or, yeah. or samjang, mm. right? Mm -hmm. mm. What besides tang would you like to introduce to your many fans? Just <sighs> so in, much, you know. New York fan. Korean hukdeji. Uh, um, you know, from Jeju, mm -hmm. Hanu, Korean beef. People don't realize how special it is compared to American, and especially Wagyu Japanese beef. Mm -hmm. um, Korean beef, the flavor, I think, comes from the muscles, comes from chewing a little. And that's why Korean beef is a little bit more chewier than, let's say, um, Wagyu. Is it? I always thought it was very marbled and quite fatty, Korean um, beef. If you compare, uh -huh. the Japanese Wagyu beef actually has much more fat content than, mm -hmm. than you know, the same scale as the uh, Korean beef. And Japanese beef sort of melts in your mouth. Mm -hmm. uh, you don't really need to chew much. Um, the flavor comes from the fat. Korean beef, the more you chew, mm -hmm. the more flavor comes out of it. True. Uh, and I think that's why we have uh, big... This. <laughs> um, and as a steak lover, as a beef lover, mm -hmm. It's such, it's more honest, you know, fat tastes good, anything, but for the actual meat mm -hmm. to taste more gozoi, sweeter while you chew, mm -hmm. that's, that's so much better. That's, that's real beef. It's real steak. Okay.
Well, thank you so much for coming. I know you've had a crazy schedule, but it was a pleasure having you, and I'm feeling hungry again, but <laughs> it was a real pleasure. Thanks so much. Pleasure being here. Thank you very much. And that was our conversation with Huni Kim, uh, chef and owner of Tanji and Hanjan. You can watch this interview once again on our homepage, aiyantv.com. Join us again next time for more Heart to Heart. Bye-bye.